We back. Welcome back to the Sophomore Tea, episode five. What am I doing with my life? You know, the show about we teach you how to get through college and I sip water this entire show. Uh, as you can see, it's just me. Cal isn't here, which is fine. I thought that would entitle me to two mugs, but I guess not. And if only you know how many comments I get on the mug. So I'm, I'm making it a thing now. We're going we're gonna to be drinking water all, all the whole time. But today we got a special guest, PJ Rosito, Director of the Career Development Office. Ooh, I'm so happy I got that. Cool, cool, cool. Tell us about yourself. Where are Mari, you? first, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course, of course. Uh, thanks to the sophomore T crew, student affairs. Yep. Great opportunity to kind of spread the word, spread my message. Um, yeah, so Director of Career Development. My goal is here to help all students, you know, from the time that they confirmed at the university um, to the point where they're negotiating their first job. Mm -hmm. So um, we really want to start with the time the students, you know, show up at orientation, yeah. make sure we're in front of them, make sure they get familiar with our faces, understand what we do, and really just getting them on the right step towards career success. Okay, yeah. A, a quick thing I want to ask, um, what does, I know you're in charge of the career office, yeah. what are the services that they offer there? That's a big question I want to Yeah, know. oh my God, so we have so many. Um, I think our, the biggest service that we offer is one-on-one -on -one career coaching. Uh -huh. So a lot of students will usually just create a booking appointment, yeah. come in, they could either do it virtually in person, mm -hmm. and really just trying to figure out where they're at in their college career and what steps they need to take to get to that next step successfully. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the first one. Uh, additionally, there's a ton of different services. We help with job search strategies, interview techniques. We really Really try to bridge the gap between the students and the employer. So yeah. whenever employers want to recruit on campus, we try to get them in front of students, whether it's through classrooms, clubs and organizations, mm -hmm. career fairs, as we were yeah. discussing. So, um, so yeah, it's really just trying to acclimate the students to the career development model, mm -hmm. get them on a certain plan, and obviously start getting them thinking about what their career is going to be. Yeah, of course. And what would you say? I like to ask this for all the um, all the officers that come in here. What would you say is a a, a good resources that you have that isn't really used as much as it should be. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few of them. Um, I think we just uh, soft launched our career closet last year and now we, we just launched it officially this year. Mm -hmm. So we really want students to understand that there is a set of professional attire that they can utilize at any point whenever it comes to interacting with employers, networking yeah. events. Um, I'd say a lot of the students don't realize the importance of career fairs. Yeah. Um, what happens is the students think, oh, it's a career fair. I only need to go when I'm worried about my career. Absolutely, but which is completely, completely, <laughs> wrong. completely wrong. Completely wrong. I think, I think students as early as first year students should really start to acclimate themselves to just interacting. I know when students come up to me before a career fair starts, they're always nervous about like, what do I do? Who do Absolutely. I talk to? I usually tell them to take a lap, get comfortable, yeah. Everybody in there is a little bit nervous to kind of get, you know, yeah. their feet wet and mm -hmm. meet people. But I think it's important that they go in with some somewhat of a plan, an elevator pitch. Yeah. I always like to kind of prepare them, you know, who you are, where you're from, what town, what your major is, yeah. and what are you looking to accomplish? Yeah. And even if you're a first year student or sophomore and you're not really looking for something, saying that is fine. Yeah. I think that's admirable. The employers might be like, oh, this student doesn't even need anything. And they're still going out of their way to meet me and introduce themselves. So I think there's always something students could take advantage of. Whenever they see something that says career development on it, yeah. they should consider attending because it, it could develop them. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I just started I started to get more in tune with career fairs now. And I, I really should have, as someone who's a senior, I got, I got almost a year left. Like I definitely should have been going to these kind of things since freshman year. They're, they're super dope. And I think part of it was just definitely that nervous factor of it. Like I just like just thinking about what am I going to do when I'm gone? It's like, it's, it's scary. And that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, how would you say someone should like prep for that kind of stuff? Like, I know I, even now I'm like, damn, I got, what do I do with my resume? What should I wear and things and stuff like that? I know you guys got the career classes, which I need to tap into because I, I come in there and come in wearing whatever, but yeah. How would you say it was, you should prepare for those things, you know, mentally, all, all such as that? Yeah, so I think there's a couple different things. I think when you first are attending a career fair, I think there's two things. You want to obviously be presentable. Yeah. So I at least tell students that business casual is encouraged. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think they should not go to a career fair because they feel underdressed because I think an employer still values the interaction. Yeah. And I don't know if they'll remember long term what they were wearing, but I do think it's important that they make sure that they're dressed appropriately. Sure. Additionally, I, I kind of have a whole resume philosophy, but I think when it comes to the resume you use for a career fair, 
warfare. Mm -hmm. It'd be something that can kind of show and, show and highlight all of your skills. Yeah. When, when you're applying to a specific job, you want to know what the job's looking for, what the hiring manager's looking for, and you want to create an application for that. Yeah. But for, for a career fair with 50 companies in a room, you want to kind of show and highlight all your skills. So I would encourage students to bring a resume that kind of highlights all aspects of their college career, including their major, clubs and organizations, volunteering community service, as well as any experiences they had in the job force. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know as me as an engineering student, I know it's like required to go and get an internship. So when I'm going to these career fairs, like, hey, I, I'm looking for internships. And I know for those who, who don't need one, they're kind of looking for um, full-time jobs and Damn, I really forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> no, it's okay. So, so for me, it's important that students know that internships are extremely important. I think every student should at least complete one before they graduate. Absolutely. Um, and I think you're lucky. I think when you're in a major that requires an internship, you're forced to do it. And then you have that experience when you graduate. I actually feel for the students who don't have that built-in internship requirement because you said need to. I think every student needs to. And if, if, if it was up to me, I think it would be a requirement university-wide mm -hmm. that a student does some type of experience, whether it's study abroad, an internship, a co-op. So I think it's important, and, I, and the number one thing I find that most students have when it comes to not finding a job right away, yeah. it's the students who didn't have that pre-graduate experience. Absolutely. So if I had a tip to tell students when it comes to what's the most crucial thing to help me make that transition in my career, it would be to get some experience in the field that they're going into prior yeah, to graduating. Yeah, and I remember in our first two episodes, I, I, I stressed on how important like these internships are, and, and really how important it is when you, when you leave, you know? And, um, Sorry, it's gonna oh, the whole episode. It's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of that. <laughs> Get used to it. Um, one thing that kind of pushed me away from these internships was kind of uh, work life balance. I know, like I'm a full time student. You know, it's I feel like the only time I was able to do these um, internships was like summertime. So that might be the prime time. And I know earlier we had talked about co op. So maybe you can go into that and yeah. and how you can balance that kind of stuff. Yeah, of course. Important. Yeah. So for me, my, when I look at the kind of the four year career development plan model, yeah. I always encourage students to focus on the summer after sophomore year and the summer after junior year is a perfect time to complete an internship. Yeah. You could really complete an internship at any point during the year, even during a semester. Yeah. But as you and I both know, with a full course load and you possibly working, that could be, you know, only a 10 to 20 hour a week internship, mm -hmm. where in the summer you can really get that full experience of like that 30 to 35 hours. Yeah. So Another thing I want students to know too is that it doesn't need to always be labeled as an internship. Even if it's a part-time job or temporary job they do in the summer, yeah. getting experience and doing the work that you could see yourself doing post-graduation is key, whether it's labeled as an internship, whether it's a part-time job, or whether it's a temporary position. Now, there are these things called co-ops, which are extremes form of internships. Yeah. What happens is you actually have to register with the university. Mm -hmm. um, you're signing up to work at a company for six months at a time, yeah. Typically it starts in January and goes through June or goes from July and goes through December. And what we make you do as a university is actually drop back to a maximum of six credits. Yeah. So you're actually like a part-time student and a full-time employee. Gotcha. And if a student can pull that off with their schedule, and I would never advise a student to do that if it's going to delay graduation, yeah. cost more money, time and effort to, to complete your degree just to fit in a co-op. But if you're a student who might be graduating a little early or graduating a little late and you only have a class or two, a co-op is a perfect opportunity because you're almost instilled right in the company and they find that most students who complete a co-op actually find an internship actually find a full-time position at that company 70 percent of the time mm -hmm. or at a competitor's company yeah. so i think the co-op is the most valuable undergraduate experience you can get but like i like i want to tell all students getting prior work experience no matter what it's labeled as is extremely important yeah yeah and i know now going to internships um it is not that easy getting uh, these jobs sometimes like i've gotten rejected so many times and i'm like hey i'm a great guy you know i feel like and I, uh, my, my question is, how do I make myself stand out in this competitive job place now? Like ever since COVID, I feel like it's impossible yeah. to get a job. Yeah, I think, I think students understand the job search process incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I think they think they need to have their one resume that they think is amazing, yeah. and they're just gonna mass apply to all these different places. Yeah. And I used to do that same thing too. I had this amazing resume that I thought was great, and I would apply to 100 companies in an hour. Yeah. 
And what I found is that you're kind of just blindly applying if you're sending the same resume over and again. Yeah. So I find that there's the secret potion in this is that you need to really identify exactly what it is that that internship description mm -hmm. or that job description is asking for, almost to the point where I'm going through very carefully and I'm underlining every skill and ability that they're asking for, sometimes even the type of wording that they're using for this company. Once I extract all the things that I think that they need to know, I'm then going back to my resume and drafting it and making it geared literally towards that job and that internship. I want whoever is making that hiring decision feel as if I created that application packet specifically for them. Gotcha. And that's the difference is you can, as a hiring manager, and I talk to employers about this all the time, they can literally see someone who just mass applied compared yeah. to someone who took the time to, to give a personalized strategic application that's geared towards that thing. So you're saying I should like adjust it after every... Yeah, so I think your thought process should be is looking at your resume as if it's a master document, a working copy that's you can just continue to add and tweak and add and tweak mm -hmm. and don't even worry about if it gets to three to four pages. I think the more content you have to work with, the better. Yeah. And then once you have all that content to work with and you identify what it is you're applying to needs to know, you then come up with the best version of that resume for that that company. What happens is, is if 100 people apply to an internship, only 10 to 15 of those people are getting the interview. Yeah. So what are you doing as a candidate to go above and beyond and be a part of that top 10 to 15%? And it's literally clear when you look at a resume who took the time and effort to be a part of that 10 to 15%. And gotcha. And for like, you know, freshmen or sophomores and even sometimes even me sometimes, like a lot of my experience is just kind of been here at school, what, what do I do when I feel like I don't have a ton to add to it? Yeah, so I mean, especially with the younger students, it's, it's understandable that you might not have experience or jobs. I think for most students, we're finding that they're coming into college without having that high school summer job or that lifeguarding position. Mm -hmm. So finding an on-campus job or a part-time job around campus, I think is extremely important. Yeah. You don't wanna go into an internship, let's say the summer after your sophomore year or summer after junior year, without having some sort of structure or job that you've had previously. So getting a student an in, a part-time job, either on campus or around campus, your freshman or sophomore year is critical. Mm -hmm. The next step would be to then transition to that internship. And no matter how minuscule you think that job was when you were in high school, whether you were just sitting behind a desk doing nothing all day or you're sitting on a lifeguard chair, showing that you actually had private previous experience is extremely important, especially to someone hiring you for an internship. Uh, so if I'm going for like, an engineering internship, is it even worth putting that I worked at Red Lobster yes. for like four years? Like, yeah, I think that's admirable. I think I think it's a matter of how much detail you go into. I really like to list all the jobs in the master resume, mm -hmm. and then you decide what stays or what goes based on what you think they're gonna see. Yeah. And that Red Lobster position could be just there by itself, or you could list all the different job responsibilities. I mean, you worked in a fast-paced environment. You worked in a team atmosphere. You had to <laughs> write, think- Write this down, write this down. You, had, <laughs> you literally had to think <laughs> quickly on your feet. You probably had to deal with good customers and you had to deal with challenging customers. Yeah. All that stuff's transferable. Yeah. All that stuff is gonna carry with you into the work environment because believe it or not, there's gonna be challenges and hardships when you come into your professional career too. And you can use those skills you might've learned, let's say, or lobster or any other position, mm -hmm. they translate. So I always try to just remind students how important those roles are, even if in their head they don't think they are. Yeah, it's definitely important to, I know we talked about it in, in our other episodes on how important it is to move past those challenges and stuff like that. What would you say is a strategy to uh, get past those kind of, you know, hey, I didn't get this inter interview, I didn't get this job, or how do I deal with that, or things such like that? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I mean, I think, I think the majority of the time, most people are gonna hear no. I think you need to be comfortable with hearing no. Yeah. In a world of no's, all you need is one yes when it comes to applications. So I think, in my mind, I, I really want the student to almost build a relationship with the job description that they want to apply to. I don't want them to just see a job description and be like, oh, this sounds good, let me apply. What I want them to do is look at a job description and read and get more and more excited as they go through. Mm -hmm. And I really want them to focus on, let's say, a handful of jobs a week yeah. and really almost kind of build a relationship by doing research on the company, trying to figure out what they need from me when it comes to this application. And then what happens is, is once you submit an application, you feel like you've given the best effort forward in what you're submitting so they think you have what it takes. You then gotta kind of drop that and then you gotta move on to the next thing. Yeah. Even if that's the number one job you had, there's nothing you can do once you apply. The, the, everything's now in their court. So you hope that you can just probably apply to two to three to four jobs a week. And if you can get in the habit of doing that week after week, by the time you hit that fifth or sixth week, 
you're going to hear from the first week. Yes. By the time you hit the sixth or seventh, you're going to hear from the second. And all you need is just kind of a, a function and, and structure of applying on a regular basis. And I think for students who don't have a job, who are looking for a job or an internship, this should almost be treated as an unpaid part-time job. You applying actively to position. Yeah, yeah. Also, I think I found the position. Like this, this works. This works right here. <laughs> so w one thing I know we had briefly talked about it before is uh, separating that passion from work. Um, I love to play video games. I love to bowl. You know, um, I'm not gonna be able to do nothing with that. You know, and I know you're, you're not gonna be a professional bowler. But shoot, the way I'm bowling, <laughs> not anytime soon. Yeah, no, no. Now, I, I, if you could talk about that ESPN yeah. example, because that was that was amazing. I love yeah, that. Yeah, so um, I think we hear that words, if you find something you love, you never have to work a day in your life. I, and, I've heard and, that. And they, you time. hear that over and over again. And I, I tend to disagree with that a little bit. As a sports fan my whole life, football, baseball, basketball, I always thought it would be my dream to work at ESPN. And luckily enough, after I graduated with my undergrad degree, I worked at ESPN, and it was great. I mean, I felt like I was in the Mecca. I was looking at TVs, yeah. screens. I literally had sports athletes walking through my department. Sounds you, like you the know. dream. Yeah. yeah. But what happens is, is eventually a job's a job, and yeah. you're going to start to see the good things and bad things. And while there was a lot of good things, a great and working environment, you know, the hours were tough. Yeah. We were literally working 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. Yeah. I think a lot of people forget there's a whole West Coast games you got to that finish up around one or two in the morning. Yeah. I was driving home in the middle of the night. You get home, your non-traditional hours. So everybody who works the normal nine to fives on a completely different schedule than you. It's hard to get to sleep. Yeah. Plus, I mean, that was my outlet. Whenever I had you know stress in my life or I wanted to kind of get away, turn on Sports Center, turn on a game, watch football on the weekends. Absolutely. Now you're that was your job. It's not as appetizing when you get home to want to turn on something you just worked on for the yeah, last eight hours. So, I kind of felt like I lost my outlet there. So. What really attracted me to higher ed was like, I missed it. After two or three years working ESPN, believe it or not, I was like, wow, I can't wait to get back into higher ed. I ended up getting a job at Eastern in the career development office there, um, worked my way up, and now I'm happy to kind of come back home. I'm originally from Meriden, which is kind of right down the road. Gotcha. My mom and dad met at Elmer's down the road, so I'm literally a product of Central, <laughs> <laughs> literally. Um, so I felt like kind of this was my area, um, and I'm happy to kind of be working with the, with the students of, of Central. Gotcha, I feel like something that I go through often even now, like, it's, it's crazy to say this, I'm, it's my fourth year, and uh, uncertainty, like, is this really what I want to do? How, or, and I know even as a freshman, freshman maybe not so much, but I know sophomores, like, how do I go about that? I feel like that's, that's something I question myself all the <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, it's an important question. I mean, I find that it's extremely important to start considering that early, because I don't know if, I, I remember back in high school, they started asking me, like, do you want this class or that class? I'm like, I didn't even think about that yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, do I want a keyboard or you know what I mean? So it's like, um, so when I got to college, it was important to let students know that it's okay to be undecided or uncertain. I mean, a lot of times I think students pick their major based on like what their aunt told them. So and who knows if their aunt knows what they're talking about. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so I think Central's unique in that we have an exploratory, off, exploratory office for undecided students. Okay. And I really do think students, if they're really unsure, should take that 30 to 45 credit, credit mark to decide if they want to pursue a certain major. Um, take that take that first semester, two or three, to really focus on all the general ed courses, figure out what you want to do. And then by the time you hit that 30 to 40 for credit mark, now it's time to make a, a decision. If you're still uncertain, go with a path of least resistance that you find most interesting. Yeah. And I honestly find if you just kind of continue to follow what you enjoy doing, what you find interesting, and what you find to be productive and, and resourceful, I'd say go for it. Mm -hmm. I know that there are students who get close to maybe that last semester, maybe they did a student teaching position or clinical or an internship and they think, oh, maybe I don't wanna do this. Yeah. Part of me thinks let's get that degree and then let's restructure and figure out what direction we wanna go in. Yeah. So I don't know if, I, if I'm a student who's early on, I kinda have kinda all the different you know paths I can take. But when you get later, it kinda gets little, littler and littler when it, based on the resources mm -hmm. you have available. But I think you always just kinda gotta look for what makes the most sense and what makes the most sense for your career. Gotcha. So, I mean, I, I'm I'm just gonna tuck it out. But I remember one, at one point last year, I I went through this like uh, this change where I I felt like I didn't want to do this anymore. before, and I looked at different careers, and I somehow found myself at nursing, which is probably the worst <laughs> option. Yeah, yeah. I, I told my parents, and and they they're always gonna support me, but they they were like, yeah, no, you don't want to do that. So yeah, that's definitely <laughs> that's definitely do that. that's definitely not something I should do. So uh, someone in my position where I'm so late my degree, you you would. Probably just finish tugging it out. Yeah, finish it. Yeah. And, and you'd be surprised. I mean, 
Obviously, there's certain majors where you're an, you're an accounting major, you're going to be an accountant. You're in finance, you're going to be working with money. Yeah. But I think sometimes, especially if, you, if you're that special person who go with the flow, flexible, easy to work with, can understand and pick up things, be trained, sometimes it, it doesn't necessarily matter what your major is. It's more of the skill set you bring and the personality you bring to the company. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if, if a boss or supervisor or hiring manager finds someone that's easy to work with, that fit well within a team and can kind of fit into that company culture, I think they would take a shot on them if they might not have the ideal major that they're pursuing. So I wouldn't worry too much. Just, there's not always linear paths when it comes to specific majors. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. I wanted to touch like into the, the deeper side of it. So Let's as it. In, this, in, this, in this economy that we're in now, yeah. um, college kind of isn't really the thing anymore, or at least it's starting to be. I know everyone's talking about, oh, I can just do trade, I can just do trade, make, be a plumber. Da, da, da. How important do you think a degree is now actually? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's extremely important. I think, I mean, they're, they're obviously the trades, but I think college gives you a baseline level of general education requirements that I think helps. I think when it comes to the people, the networking, mm -hmm. I mean, even people I went to school with, I still interact with on a regular basis. They now cohere with me. So I just think you're missing a social environment that I think is educational in itself, yeah. not even counting the academic side of the house. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but you'll probably reflect on it after you graduate, but college was the best four or five years absolutely, of my life. I mean, I, my best friend I met there, most of the people in my wedding party I met there, I met my wife there. So while while there are, are different ways to get to your ideal profession and, and your career, mm -hmm. I think the experience in itself is is worth is worth the time, yeah. money, and effort. Yeah, and those connections, I, I was a oh running theme that we have, like making those connections, at, like it's crazy how many connections you make in college. Like I wouldn't be where I am now. I touched on it before, like, I'm an RA now. The first two years, I wasn't really doing much, and now that I've I've been RA, I've met so many people, so many residents. It's definitely like increased the quality of my life. You know, I feel like I'm on a path now. I have people that support me in things as such as that. Hey, you're plugged in, man. Yeah, yeah I mean, and that's what I. That's how I, I feel bad because we know, you know, out of the, all the undergrad students. We know there's a population that just come to campus, close the door, go to class, class is over, go back to their yeah. car. And as you and I both know that there's so many other things that the university offers. And even when I'm working with employers, they're not looking for that 4.0 student. They're looking for the well-rounded student. And I think the, the four main factors, especially when it comes to the resume that you're putting together, is good academics, a good internship or experience in the field you're going into, clubs and organizations, and volunteer and community service. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're not involved in a club, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, to me, first and foremost, you need to join the club mostly associated with your major. Okay. And now after the pandemic, a lot of these clubs are virtual, they record them. You don't necessarily need to be present. But my advice would be is just join the club, sit in the back, listen to what's going on, get involved if you wanna get involved, don't get involved if you don't, but just be a part of something, be a part of a team. And then I also encourage students to get involved with something that they're more fun and recreational, maybe the car club or mm -hmm. ski club, yeah. whatever gives them enjoyment and, and you know, in their personal life. And then lastly, I mean, we have a whole community engagement office mm -hmm. that their whole, their whole reason for being is to offer opportunities for students, especially in the surrounding community. So if you leave college and you didn't do a Friends of Rudolph or a Relay for Life or yeah. something to give back, I think you're missing out. And I think what happens is students who just got the 4.0, who did the basic and, and then go home, after they graduate, they're gonna realize, oh my God, I missed all these opportunities that I should take advantage of. Yeah. Um, so I can't stress enough for the, especially those students who don't live on campus, who don't get that front row seat to what's going on, take some time and, and get involved. I mean, you never know who your future boss colleague's gonna be. You never know who you're gonna meet that can help you introduce you to that person. Mm -hmm. So I just can't stress how important it is to take advantage of the entire college experience and don't let it pass you by, because once it's over, it's over. Yeah, especially like for those commuting folks, I, I commuted for a week, like yeah. they're, they're they have the roughest. I commuted and it was it was it was bad. I'd come and I'd stay for an hour or two and then just leave not knowing that I was missing out on much. I didn't even know what the career office was. I just I just thought there was a bunch of classrooms here <laughs> and, and some dorms. So yeah, there's definitely a disconnect that I feel like they need to get more involved as well. I get it. Yeah, I mean, I just feel bad because I think you're, you're not only paying for your degree, but you're paying for the experience. And I think the experience could be sometimes the most valuable part of it. Yeah. No, so right. um, I, I do feel bad for students who don't kind of see it from that perspective, but hopefully they're watching this podcast and they'll, they'll hear it. Yeah, we'll watch it, watch <laughs> it, yeah. 
Um, so for the, the career development office, is there some corner of like a uh, way that you mask get out information? I know some offices have Instagrams. Yeah. I, wellness told me they had a TikTok as well. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. So how do you guys? Yeah, we're doing our stuff? best. I mean, we're trying to get any way we can get in front of the students. Um, we have social media. I do a lot of email blasts through Handshake, which people have probably gotten from me. Definitely if, if you're a student who's gotten an email from either myself or Handshake, check those out. I'm not just trying to like, you know, get attention on something. I'm actually trying to offer you you an opportunity so if you see something definitely open it up but word of mouth i mean we're, we're getting on the tvs we're trying to use every outlet we can to kind of catch students attention and that's the thing yeah. students have so many things that are trying to grab their attention with social media and mm -hmm. stuff they can get involved in it it's definitely tough but I, I think students need to make it a priority to, to make career development part of their college career and it's not just something you wait for at the end yeah and could you just like, go on more about handshake i had i was doing the headshots today and i remember some kid didn't even know what a handshake was or, yeah. or a linkedin could you just See how yeah, important so, those actually um, can be. Yeah, so we added Handshake a few years back. It's it's been a blessing. Um, most universities' career services office have some sort of platform they use when it comes to employer and student interaction. Yeah. For most schools across the country, Handshake's it. It's like the kind of the the, the best model out there. Yeah. Um, what students do, what students have to do, is use their central email account mm -hmm. to create their credentials. I've created an account for everybody. They just need to activate it. Once they activate it, what you can do is you'll have access to now a job database. I'm literally approving 50 to 100 jobs a weekday on that, on that platform. So if a student comes to me and says, I'm having a hard time finding a job or internship, and I say, have you checked Handshake? And they say no, then they're not doing everything they can to find a job or internship. That's the number one place I would tell them to look. Additionally, you can connect with all the employers who registered, and it's got every employer you could possibly think of. So you can like flag an employer, you can see who they're recruitment team is. Anytime something f pops up, it'll show it on your main screen. Additionally, all our career fairs are registered on there, so you could see what employers are coming ahead of time. You can kind of have a hit list of what employers you want to make sure you target when you go to the career fair, and then you talk to the others after you talk to those 10 or 20. Um, it's just a huge community that allows students to almost similar to like a LinkedIn page or Facebook page where you can put your, your major, the clubs, upload different versions of your resume. Employers can actually be attracted to you on there and reach out to you for opportunities. Yeah. The sad part is, is right now we only have about 33% of our undergraduate students who've activated their account and our goal is to try to get that number as close to hundred yeah. as possible. So I assume most of those students are the ones that do need internships or jobs, but we've been pushing handshakes since the students step on campus and we're hoping that they activate that. Mm -hmm. um, really cool tool and I, and I think students would really love it if they if they checked it out. Yeah, and in the career office, they offer a headshot. How important is it to have a headshot oh on Oh my there? God, so, so before the headshot, yeah. LinkedIn. Every time I'm in a, I'm presenting to a senior class, I'll ask how many students have a LinkedIn account? And it's like 40%, maybe 30%. Uh -huh. I'm extremely surprised because part of me thinks that like this generation of college students is plugged in. They know the technology. That, but surprisingly, they're, LinkedIn's foreign to a lot of college students. I like, didn't know what it was before. I, I, it was like <laughs> last year. So I, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised. Um, so we actually have right on our website a LinkedIn guide that takes you step by step through the process of putting together what should be the best LinkedIn profile you could possibly put together. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it's pretty much your master resume like we were talking about before that kind of covers everything. Yeah. The great thing about LinkedIn is when you are Googled or someone searches for you on the internet, it's automatically gonna top in the, pop in the top one, two, or three searches. Yeah. So if you're going for an interview, and a lot of times you'll be interviewed virtually during the first round of an, inter for an internship or full-time job, the likelihood that the person interviewing you virtually, they're actually Googling you. And if they see your LinkedIn profile that supports what you're talking about and doing, even better. Mm -hmm. um, LinkedIn has a lot of great features. If, if, if anybody is familiar with LinkedIn, I think the alumni feature is awesome. So if you went on LinkedIn right now and you went onto the central page, yeah. you click on alumni, you could search the alumni by year they graduated and then keyword. So let's say for you, you go in and put, you know, 2020 to 2022 robotics, and it shows every person who's on LinkedIn who graduated from central, who has robotics in the resume, and then it shows them where they actually work. And now you can go in and connect with all the students who now work at Travelers, who grad, all the alumni who now work at Travelers who graduated with a robotics degree. Hey, I'm a student at Central right now. I see you graduated from the robotics department. Any advice you have for me? Can I connect with you on? It's, so it's a great tool. Um, I also encourage students to get acclimated with professional associations. Okay. So every industry has professional associations. Marketing, American Marketing mm -hmm. Association. Psychology, the, the Psychology Association of America. Most of these professional associations, there's usually like anywhere from 10 to 20 for each industry. Robotics has their own. You could go on the LinkedIn, 
follow these professional associations. And now you have professionals all over the globe that are experts in that field. You can now connect with, you can read articles on what the latest, greatest things that are happening in robotics. That, all that stuff's gonna help you when you go to that interview process, when they say, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Oh, I just read an article on this or that. This is what I think about it. And it just kinda, you almost wanna like saturate yourself in everything that's going on in that industry so you're ready to talk about and, and answer any question that might come up. So you would say that connection with alumni is, is super important? Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so LinkedIn helps with that. I think, I think um, the headshots, as you were talking about, we want to make sure it's a professional headshot. It's not like your, your link. It's not like your um, Instagram or Facebook, where it might be you more like having fun or kind of a personal thing. You, you want it to be professional. We actually have free headshots right in our office. Um, we can do for you, and we can actually even take it on the road. Um, and do some headshots as well. But I think employer uh, alumni interaction is critical and you'll find that most alumni, especially who are working in the field, they wanna like give back and talk to students. Yeah, sure. One of the things that students might have received emails from me on is the Travelers Career Conversations. Mm -hmm. So Travelers has committed to sending CCSU alumni who work at Travelers either virtually or in person to campus for office hours. Yeah. And what these office hours are, is students can sit there for 30 minutes at a time and just connect with them about anything. There's no job at the end of the interview. It's much more of an informational interview as to what it was like to go through the process. What were you thinking of when you were in my shoes? I think the more you can build your network, let people know you're searching and connect with alumni, I think it's more likely things are gonna fall into place. Yeah, man, that's great, man. I, I'm glad you came on today, because oh, this, that, hey, you threw a ton of information at me that, that it was great, and I can't wait to watch this episode, because awesome. there's a ton of information on here that not just I, but everyone who's watching this video can can take from. So is there anything, closing remarks, anything, you, and if, if you were to hear one thing, like what would it be to, the, to, to these people? Yeah, I think if, if you haven't put together a career development plan, now's the time. Absolutely. Especially if you're a sophomore or, or junior or senior, sit down with my office, one-on-one -on -one counseling session. Let's put together what the next natural steps need to be, and let's put you in the best position possible to, to achieve that, that degree along with a job. Now, we could also help students if they want to pursue a master's program. Mm -hmm. We could help students if they want to do a service learning project after they graduate. Whatever that plan is, let's put a, at least a plan together. What I don't want students to do is wait till last minute and come in and be like, all right, I'm ready to start my career development journey now, and they're about to graduate in a week. Absolutely. So definitely come in early. There's not going to be too much you have to do, just a natural couple things you need to do each year. So when you do get to that senior year, you're ready to go. I think every student should be entering their senior year ready to, ready to pursue that full-time job and ready to start applying almost a semester before they graduate. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you heard it here first from the man, man. Get connected, go career advising, they're, they're dope. Um, and that's it for today. Uh, make sure you tune in next week. We are our next episode, episode six, where we're talking about don't be an NPC with advising. Thank you.